Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, we start with a very quick summary of uh, this uh, morning session uh, by uh, recalling a few of the symbols I introduced. So we had a predictor mapping from the input space to the real numbers, and for this predictor and the loss function and an unknown distribution p, we considered the risk of f, which was just the uh, average loss with respect to the distribution p. We also considered the base risk, which was the smallest possible risk, where smallest uh, was uh, considered over all possible predictors. A base predictor was a predictor which achieves this minimal risk. And then we had a couple of different notions of learning. Basically, they boil down to that we want the predictors of a learning method uh, satisfy that the corresponding risk of these predictors converge to the best possible risk, uh, either in probability or in some uh, other notions. And we have seen that asymptotically this is possible by universally consistent methods, but uh, no uniform rates were possible if we restrict our considerations to infinite x and non-trivial learning problems. Um, based on this negative result, we then looked for optimal rates with respect to certain sets of distributions, and we eventually looked at so-called adaptive learning algorithms, which were able to achieve the corresponding optimal rates for a wide range of different uh, sets of distributions. And maybe I haven't really stressed uh, the last point so well. Ideally, these algorithms are fully automated. So we don't really want these algorithms to have some extra knobs we can fool around with. They simply should, should just do what they're supposed to do without any additional input of us. Okay, so this was uh, the uh, part about uh, the questions of statistical learning theory, and then we introduced empirical risk minimizers, and what we now do is to generalize uh, the notion of empirical risk minimizers in the following way. So again, we have a set of functions f, mapping from x to r, and now we additionally assume that we have a second map, uh, um, upsilon, which maps from f to the non-negative real numbers, and we call this map a regularizer. And what we basically now look at are learning methods whose predictors are contained in this set f, and which minimize a regularized empirical risk. So if you omit the regularizer, then you just get the standard empirical risk minimization formula, and now we have added the regularizer on the left and the right-hand side. This is the only difference. And of course, if we set this regularizer to be equal to zero for all functions of script f, then we get empirical risk minimization again. Um, and in particular, all the remarks we have made about empirical risk minimization also apply to this regularized form of it. So, in general, we do not need to have such a minimizer. If we have such a minimizer, this minimizer does not need to be unique, and this method may underfit or overfit uh, depending on the situation we are in. So everything we have uh, said so far about empirical risk minimization is also true for this generalization. And uh, our goal now is to investigate the statistical properties of such learning methods. But before we do that, uh, let us briefly have a look at a few examples of these um, learning methods because they are relatively widely spread. And the first general class of uh, these learning methods are so-called dictionary methods. So here we have, in this case, just a finite set of functions, h1 to hm. They also can be infinitely many, but uh, let's stick to finitely many. And now we consider linear combinations of these 
functions h1 to hm, which we call um, base functions or the elements of our dictionary. And the uh, set of all these linear combinations is our uh, set script f uh, we want to um, minimize over. Yeah? So in this case, script f is a vector space. And then we have to consider a regularizer. And I just uh, gave here the three examples of commonly used regularizers. Uh, one regularization basically looks at the sum of the absolute values of absolute values of these coefficients. This is, for example, the regularization which is uh, used in the lasso method. Um, L2 regularization does a similar thing, um, except that it actually considers here should be a power of 2. It considers not the sum of the absolute values, but the sum of the uh, squared values. And then we can also consider different norms here, like the L-infinity uh, norm. Um, so this is uh, one general uh, example of em regularized empirical risk minimization, but there are others as well. Um, for example, support vector machines belong to this class with a different sort of regularizer. Certain regularized decision trees also belong to this class, and there are plenty of other methods as well which fall under this category of learning algorithms. So, uh, in a certain sense, these learning algorithms are relatively uh, widely spread over the literature, and so it makes sense to really consider how they perform in view of our questions. Okay, before we do that, we make a few extra assumptions on the type of regular empirical risk minimizers uh, we want to consider. Some of them are just technical nature, so that we actually can prove something. Um, and the first one is, that the regularizer should be of norm type. So that means that we have a certain norm, maybe we take a power of it, and we multiply this norm by a regularization parameter. And uh, if you remember, the regularizers of um, the dictionary method, they were all of this form here. Yeah? And uh, for support vector machines, you actually have this kind of regularizer, regularizer as well. So this is a rather general form of regularization. And uh, we also consider, as for the um, dictionary methods, sets which are actually vector spaces of functions. And in this case, we write E rather than script F. So this is our first convention. The second uh, convention is a bit more technical, which basically means that if I consider the norm of an element in F, that this norm is larger than the supremum of that function. Yeah, it's a technical assumption which helps us uh, a lot. And uh, again, for the uh, methods I mentioned uh, previously, one can usually enforce uh, this assumption uh, relatively easily. And then, to display the ideas more cleanly, uh, we have to make another assumption, which is actually not necessary at all, but it makes uh, all the arguments hopefully a little bit more clear, is that we also have some sort of an infinite sample solution of our learning algorithm. What does that mean? So the uh, re regularized empirical risk minimization optimizes such an expression where we have here the empirical risk. What we now do is we replace this empirical risk by the true risk and assume that this optimization problem also has a solution. If we, don't, if we are actually in a situation where we don't have such a solution, we can actually approximate this uh, solution sufficiently well and then all the arguments I will uh, explain later on work through as well. But uh, here, for simplicity, we assume that this holds. Um, by the way, for support vector machines, this is indeed true. Okay, so these are the conventions. And now let us have a look at the classical argument for investigating empirical risk minimization and um, regularized empirical risk minimization. 
So the basic idea is that we assume that we have a data set D for which the empirical risk and the true risk of all functions in our set F are close together. Yeah? This is not very surprising because uh, the basic idea of uh, empirical risk minimization or the regularized version of that is that uh, we hope that the empirical risk of a function is a good approximation of the true risk. This is the intuitive motivation for empirical risk minimization. And now what we do is we make this assumption explicit. We assume that we have a data set for which this holds. And then the argument of analyzing empirical risk minimization is actually just a few lines. So what do we do? We start with the regularizer of our uh, predictor plus its true risk. And then we first add and subtract the uh, empirical risk of this predictor. Yeah? So we added zero. Now, in the next step, we see that this difference here actually can be bounded by epsilon because of this assumption. Here we have p, here we have d, and we consider the same function. So we can estimate this difference by epsilon. This is uh, what we've done here. And now we see that we actually have the formulation of the um, optimization problem we solved by regularized empirical risk minimization. So that this expression is smaller than or equal than this expression for any other f from the function class f. So in particular, we can compare it to fp. Yeah. So fd is the minimizer of this function here, of this joint function, and therefore this expression is smaller than, smaller than or equal to this expression. Okay, so the only thing we have to do one more time is to apply our assumption again to replace d by p. And this gives us another error of epsilon, so we end up with having error 2 epsilon, and now we have this form here. Okay, so this is, yes? So, um, from here to here, so FD is the minimizer of this joint function. So FP is in script F, so the value of that is greater than or equal than the, minima, than the minimal value. It's just the definition of empirical risk minimization, a regularized empirical risk minimization. No, 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 no. So FD optimizes this with respect to D. Yes? So FD is the, sm is the function which makes this entire expression smallest. So it's smaller than this one. That's all. Maybe we discuss that later again. <laughs> okay. So this is basically the main idea. So let's summarize that again. So we assume this uniform bound, and we got this inequality. And the difference between the inequality of the previous slide and on this slide is just that I subtracted the base risk on both sides. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Well, so what do we have to do in order to further analyze it? There are two things to be done. First, we have to estimate the probability of this uniform bound, yeah, so that we know when we actually can apply the argument. And second, we somehow have to understand this red term here. And as soon as we estimated the probability of this event and have an understanding of what this red term does, well, we basically have achieved our analysis. And this is what we will do in the following slides. Um, I will begin with estimating this probability. Every, everything so far clear? Okay. <laughs> 
So let's assume first that we only have finitely many functions f in script f. Then the first observation is that estimating this probability can be expressed by 1 minus the probability of the uh, converse event. Yeah? This is uh, nothing than uh, standard uh, algebra with the probability measures. And now, what does this mean here? So we have a supremum. This means that we actually have one f for which this holds. So this actually is some sort of a union over the functions of f. And unions in the probability can be pulled out by making the expression larger. So because we have a minus in front, we make everything smaller. This is basically using p of a or b is smaller than or equal than p of a plus p of b. Okay, so what have we achieved? Well, we achieved that instead of bounding this somewhat complicated looking thing, we have to estimate these probabilities, where the difference between this one and this one is that we no longer have to deal with all the functions f simultaneously, but we can now only deal with each function separately. Okay? So, it basically means that we have to estimate these probabilities for each f of our function set, script f. And something which I would like to stress out s is that so far we have, no, we have not made any assumptions about the distribution p. Yeah? So, in particular, we did not assume that our data is iid, nor did we actually assume that it's somewhat random. Okay, so the next step will be to deal with these sort of estimates if we assume that the data is IID. Just to give you an idea of how the analysis works. And to this end, we have to look into the literature and look for estimates of such quantities. Maybe the easiest estimate you may have seen is the estimate you get from the weak law of large numbers where it's basically an application of Chebyshev's inequality. This would be the very easiest way to estimate such a quantity. It turns out that uh, in many cases this is way too crude, and therefore we use a different inequality known as Höfting's inequality. Okay, what does this inequality say? So, we assume that we have a probability space and random variables c1 to cn, which are independent and bounded. This boundedness is crucial. And then the statement says that if we compare the empirical average of these random variables to the true average, then the difference that the, uh, says that the probability that the difference is larger than some value is small. Yeah? You must think of t to be large, n large, so if t, uh, tau is large, this right-hand side is small, and if n is large, this is also small. So with high probability, this expression is small. This is the basic idea about that. Okay, so this is the inequality we'd like to use, and uh, now i show you how we can use it. Um, so, in our specific case, we deal with samples of length n and uh, distributions q, which are just the product distribution, which makes sure that all our sample pairs xi, yi are independent. This is just the mathematical way to, to describe the independence, the independence, and uh, also the identical distribution. Okay. So then we define the random variables Ci of D, uh, 
to be the loss at sample xi when we predict by f at the point xi. Now, L is non-negative because it's a loss function, so therefore A is equal to zero. Yeah? And this expression, which Höfting's inequality estimates, so we just have to make a copy and paste thing, this expression here, which is on the left-hand side here, is nothing else than the difference of the empirical risk of F and the true risk. Yeah? Because the empirical risk of F is the average of all these sums and uh, the average of these true risks because this is always the same. It's nothing else than the true risk. So whenever we know that our loss is not only bounded from below but also from above by some constant b, then we can set small b equal to capital B and we can apply this inequality. And then we use the union bound I've showed you on the previous slide and get uh, information about uh, our assumption on the data set D. And the corresponding result looks the following for empirical risk minimization over a finite non-empty set of functions and loss functions which just assume this boundedness condition I've uh, mentioned on the previous slide. So, mm, these are the assumptions, and now the result says that our risk of the predictor FD for the data set D is smaller than the best risk in our function class script F plus some error term. And this inequality holds with high probability. Again, we have to think about tau being large so that this one is close to 1 and n large so that this one becomes small. Yeah? So this one is, with high probability, smaller than this plus this error term. This error term is O of 1 over square root of n. Yes, please. So it all depends on your set of functions f and whether you have bounded or unbounded uh, labels. If you have unbounded labels, yeah, you have to use different uh, concentration inequalities. Yeah? Instead of hefting, you could uh, use some generalizations if you know some uh, uh, bounds on the tails. If you don't have these bounds, you have to go back to Chebyshev basically. Yeah? So using hefting inequality is by no, nee by no means necessary. It's just an example how you would do it. Okay, so um, this term goes to zero with one over square root of n. Um, what this inequality, inequality does not specify is the approximation error. Namely, the difference between the best risk in the class F and the best overall risk. Yeah? So it only sa tells us something about the statistical error. Basically meaning that it controls the overfitting. It does not control the underfitting. What we also see is that the size of the function class F matters, but only in a relatively mild manner. Yeah? So we don't have to consider the uh, size of the function class, but only the logarithm of the function class size. But of course, if script F is infinite, uh, this bound is meaningless. Um, so the next question we will consider is the following. What happens if this function class is actually infinite? And how can we deal with regularized empirical risk minimizers, so with the methods which also have a regularization term in front. Most of the arguments I've presented so far works uh, for regularized empirical risk minimization if we keep f finite, basically everything, we just have to add the um, corresponding regularizers, but uh, we are more interested in the uh, case where script f 
is a vector space, and in this case, of course, this assumption is satisfied, and therefore our analysis so far is meaningless. Okay, so we have to go back and have a look um, what the difficulty is uh, in our approach so far. So what we did was to take the union bound to make a conclusion from an estimate of this form for a single f to all of the functions in f. Yeah? And the union bound pulled out a sum out of the probability. Now the sum is may become infinite if um, we have an infinite set f, so therefore this approach didn't will not work. Mm. Yet there is a way to actually deal with infinite f, and the idea is that we replace script f by some finite set script n do the union bound on this smaller finite set script n, for which it works, and then we also have to investigate what the error is uh, using the smaller set n instead of uh, the entire script f set. So this is the uh, general approach. We fix some delta greater than zero. We our goal is then to find a finite set script n of delta of functions for which this term we want to estimate can be, estimate, can be estimated by the same term where we replaced script f by our finite set and an error term of the order of delta. And once we have found such a finite set n delta, we then apply the union bound for n delta, and everything works. This is the idea. How we find that uh, set, I will tell you in a few slides. Let us first have a look um, what the effect will be on the inequality. So the old inequality was of this form, where we had our script f. And now if we go from script f to um, our finite set, then we have to apply the union bound on this finite set, so script f disappears here, and we have to take uh, script n instead. But also, we have an additional error because of using a finite set, which is this plus delta. This will be effect. And now assume that for each delta greater than zero, we find such a set. The next step would be to optimize the right-hand side with respect to delta. And this is what we will do. We will look for each delta for a small set, script n, and then optimize the right-hand side of the new inequality. OK, so this is the basic outline. And now the next question is, how can we find, actually, such small, finite, yet well approximating sets script n. And it turns out that there are various ways, and I will just talk about one particular one because it's rather generic. It's called covering numbers. So this, at first glance, looks a little bit complicated, so I try to explain the main idea here. So let's assume that we have some f set m, which has a distance function d on it. So in this case, our set M would be this uh, black line here. And now we also fix, uh, well, in this case, uh, A would be M. We also um, fix some subset of M and some accuracy epsilon. And now we look for finitely many points, x1 to xn, such that these points approximate our set A up to accuracy epsilon. And geometrically, this means the following. So we look for points, these are the black points here, such that whenever we draw a ball around these points with radius epsilon, then the union of these balls must cover the set A. 
So whenever we have found such finitely many points x1 to xn, which cover um, our set A with the balls of radius epsilon, we call these uh, set points x1 to xn an epsilon cover. And the covering number, the epsilon covering number now looks for the smallest such set x1 to xn. Just do not want to find some set x1 to xn, we want to find the smallest one. Yeah? Kind of minimal covering set here. There are, in general, infinitely many, yes, indeed. <laughs> and we want to find the smallest one. It's not the smallest one, is smallest one. Okay? So this is the um, basic idea. And as I said, um, points x1 to xn with this property are called epsilon nets, and the epsilon covering number is simply the size of the of a smallest epsilon net. Okay, so covering numbers, as it turns out, have actually been studied in mathematics for 50, 60 years. And uh, therefore, there's a huge literature on uh, estimating covering numbers. Usually, it's extremely hard to compute covering numbers exactly, but uh, it is often well, not easy, but now on how to, e to find upper bounds on the covering numbers. And uh, here's the first known bound for bounded subsets of RD, the covering numbers of these bounded sets simply behave like a constant C times epsilon to the power minus D. And here it does not matter which kind of norm we consider, just con think about the Euclidean norm, for example, but it doesn't really matter. And whatever norm we take, it will only influence this leading constant here. Yes. Um, the reason behind that is, <laughs> the reason behind that is, um, so what does, what does it mean, having a finite epsilon net? It means that, in principle, what you can do is you can consider for each point of the set an epsilon ball around it, and that gives you an infinite cover of the set, yeah, because all the points are considered. Now, if you have a compact set, you know that whenever you have an open cover, you find a finite one. And the only difference here is that uh, you do not necessarily need for bounded sets the boundary of A to be included to get the finiteness. This is the idea, yeah. So covering numbers in this sense describe the compactness, quantify compactness of sets. This is, this is the basic idea. Okay, so what happens if we consider sets of functions from X to R? Well, as it turns out, the behavior of the, ent uh, of the covering numbers may be very different. Very, very different. In fact, it turns out that you have such a nice estimate if and only if A is finite dimensional. And the dimension is then D. Otherwise, whenever you deal with something infinite dimensional, this cannot be true. Yet, there is a huge literature on estimating uh, covering numbers for sets of functions, and typically estimates which you can find in the literature look like this. So you consider a ball of one vector space, consider a metric of a different, uh, of a different vector space where E is contained in, then take the covering numbers, and for conventional reasons, we take actually the logar the logarithm of the um, covering numbers, and then typical estimates uh, basically say that these logarithms behave like epsilon to some power, and usually, if uh, f is a set of functions on let's say some subset of R d, then the value of p is influenced heavily 
by the smoothness of the functions in, in E. Meaning that the smoother the functions in E are, the smaller the value P is. This is basically the idea. Um, so, not really. So, it may have been a little bit misleading that I used x1 to xn as the uh, points. Yes, so actually if we deal with a set of functions, these x1s to xn's are actually functions. Yeah, not uh, samples. And as it turns out, uh, the uh, general idea I, I just mentioned uh, at the very beginning, how we deal from how we go from finite to infinite sets, just assume that we find such an epsilon net. It and what we only need here is that we have to know that there is such a finite epsilon net, and we don't need to know how it uh, looks like. And all these uh, estimates from above just tell tells us basically there is a finite epsilon net whose size is not larger than this. And what we will do then is we will just pick such a finite epsilon net. Yes, yeah. And we don't really need to consider how this uh, finite epsilon net looks like, fortunately. Otherwise, it would be hell. Okay, so um, we have seen how we go from the old to the new oracle inequality by using a finite... Uh, sets as an approximator and now a corresponding theorem may look like this we have to make a technical assumptions that l is lipschitz continuous in its third argument this is not really necessary for the argument i will present continuity in the third argument however would be necessary if, if uh, l is not continuous in the predictions then the argument won't work yeah? So in particular, if L would be the classification loss, the argument doesn't work, and then one has to go to, for example, VZ dimension instead. But uh, let's say for the absolute loss and the uh, least square loss, as long as the predictions and the observations are bounded, this is actually true. And if it's not Lipschitz continuous, we may actually weaken the argument and it still works. Okay, so we assume again that we have a bound, um, and also we assume that we have a minimal epsilon net of f, so that means that the size of this minimal epsilon net is just this quantity here. And then we have seen on the previous slide that we actually have this kind of inequality. And what remains to be done is we need to estimate this right-hand side with respect. We have to optimize with respect to epsilon. But this, wait a second, but this can, o can only be done if we make assumptions on the uh, behavior of this. Yes, please. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, the, the question wasn't clear to me either. So, I <laughs> which which term? This one? Ah, this is the error term of uh, this is the error term of Höfting's inequality combined with the union bound. So, for example, that B, when we applied Höfting's inequality, that B came from this assumption here. And this logarithm here came from the fact that we considered the union bound. We would have first had the sum over all F in that function here, and then we just made an algebraic transformation, moving the sum first in the exponential and then making a variable substitution. <laughs> 
This is basically the idea. Okay, so let's have a look what happens if we make a very particular assumption on the behavior of the covering numbers. So we keep in the situation, we stay in the situation we have previously considered, and now we make the assumption that our log covering numbers actually behave the way I said it is typical in the literature. And uh, our bound then becomes this here. We basically just replaced this logarithm here by the estimate. And uh, now, we have to es now we have to optimize over epsilon. And the result is, this is just simple calculus, an estimate of this form here. Yeah? We just optimize over epsilon, and then it turns out that the true epsilon is of this form here, basically. And then we have some ugly constant in front of it, and uh, everything else. Yeah, can be computed relatively straightforward. It's, it's no magic. It's just one-dimensional optimization using standard calculus. Taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero, and so on. OK, if we want to compare it to the result we had for empirical risk minimization over finite f, we saw that in that case, this additional term wasn't there. So the difference between empirical risk minimization over finite f and over infinite f with this property is this extra 2p here in the fraction. Yes? Yes. So instead of uh, considering all f, we uh, con use the centers of the covering balls instead, yes. If f, if the script f contains very smooth functions, we need fewer centers. Yes, yeah. So if, basically what that means is, the smoother f is, the smaller p becomes, and the closer this fraction here is to is uh, to a half. P, well, for Sobolev uh, spaces, you can estimate the p in terms of the smoothness. For some other smoothness classes, you can do the same. Yeah, it's just an informal way of saying that the smoother the class of functions is, the larger, the smaller the p is. Yeah, and the effect is that the corresponding exponent here gets closer to a half. So this is uh, the uh, first part where we uh, went from finite f to infinite f. And now we also have to deal with the regularizers. OK. So what are the difficulties here? So I mentioned that we are now interested in regularized empirical risk minimizers where our underlying set of functions is actually a vector space. Well, vector spaces are never, ever compact, except they are just the zero space. But except that very particular space, vector spaces are never compact, because they're not even bounded. Yeah? And therefore, we always have infinite covering numbers for these spaces, which is too bad. So apparently, the approach I talked so far about, the analysis, doesn't work at all. And uh, now the trick is that uh, we have to have a closer look at the very particular form of the regularized empirical risk minimizers we consider. And it turns out that although regularized empirical risk minimizers solve this kind of problem, for the regularizers we consider, namely the ones which are of norm type, the optimization problem is actually taken in a significantly smaller set than E. And this is what I'd like to show you on the next slide. So this is the lemma. Assume, for simplicity, that our loss function for prediction 0 is smaller than or equal to 1, 
could uh, replace that by some other constant. Uh, and then the result says that whenever I choose a regular empirical risk minimizer predictor with the regularization parameter lambda, then its norm is bounded by lambda to the power mi 1 minus, uh, minus 1 over alpha. Yeah? So that means instead of considering the optimization problem over the entire space E, the optimization, since the minimum is actually has actually this, this norm here, the minimum can be sought in the ball with this radius. So in a two-dimensional world, if we try to optimize that uh, regularization pro uh, this uh, optimization problem over the, the over the plane, that result says that if we pick a lambda, then instead of considering over instead of considering the entire plane, we only have to consider this ball of radius lambda to the power one minus one over epsilon one over alpha. Alpha, ah, alpha. What is alpha? Alpha. Alpha was the power of the regularization. Ah, oh, wait a second. I should have a... Uh, here. So we considered regularizers of this form here. For example, for the lasso, alpha would be 1. For rich regression, alpha would be 2. For support vector machines, alpha would be 2, 2. Yeah? It's a value which just depends on the algorithm we consider. I should have drawn that. Okay. So surprisingly, this uh, proof is also very simple. Um, so we have two assumptions now. One is that the loss is non-negative, and the other one is that when predicting with zero, it's uh, bounded by one from above. And uh, now we first observe that if we consider the regularization term, we can make the expression larger by adding the empirical risk. And this is true simply because the loss is non-negative and therefore the empirical risk is also non-negative. Now we use the definition of the predictor, which is simply the function fd lambda, which achieves this infimum. This was the very definition of fd lambda. And uh, now we compare this infimum with one very particular function of this vector space. And that very particular function is the zero function, which is everywhere zero. For that function, the norm is zero. And we only end up with the empirical risk of the zero function. This is the next step. And finally, what we do is that we use this estimate here, which says that if we predict with zero, then all the individual losses will be bounded by one, and therefore this empirical risk will also be bounded by one. And that's it. Now we do some algebraic reformulations, and uh, we have found the bound. Okay, very simple. So, this is good news. We do not... Uh, have to give up our basic idea. We just have to uh, use the fact that regular empirical risk minimizers of this form do not optimize over the entire space, but actually just over a smaller subset. And now what we do is to use everything we have developed so far for these balls of radius epsilon, uh, of radius uh, lambda to the power minus one over alpha. Okay, and the corresponding result looks like this. So all these things are as in the previous uh, theorems and results. No extra assumption besides this one here. And then the result says that with high probability, this term here on the left-hand side, which consists of the risk of our predictor plus the regularization term, can be bounded 
from above by the corresponding term of the infinite sample solution plus some statistical error. And uh, what we want to do now is to have a closer look on the meaning of this estimate and how we now can use this estimate to derive um, consistency in learning rates. Yeah? So let's have a closer look here. So this is, yes. Yes. So this estimate always holds, even if E is infinite dimensional, because we have this assumption here. Well, you have to remember that... Uh, repeating the question? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, if you consider an infinite dimension dimensional space and consider the unit ball in that space, that ball is not compact with, its with respect to its own norm. But if you consider a different norm, it may be compact. So, for example, if you consider the set of Lipschitz continuous functions with Lipschitz uh, um, constant smaller than or equal to 1 and uh, supremum norm smaller than or equal to 1. This is the unit ball of the space of Lipschitz continuous functions. And by a classical theorem of analysis, this ball is compact in the space of continuous functions. Azela Ascoli. That's a very 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 standard assumption so and what we now make and what we do see here is that we have two different norms e and the supremum norm and we don't require the unit ball to be compact with respect to e but only with respect to the supremum norm and this is why it works this is the sweet spot okay so this is the oracle inequality in the form of the previous slide. And what we now do is to do some uh, extra, adding some extra terms. First of all, we subtract actually the base risk on both sides. Yeah, nothing changes there. And what we now do is that we replace this base risk by the minimal risk in FP and uh, add this minimal risk again. So what we end up having here is we subtract the best risk in E, add this best risk in E again, and here we subtract again the base risk. So we have three terms. One we have understood. This is the term we have understood. We have an explicit form of that. And what remains is to understand these two terms. Okay, let's give these two terms two names. The first term here, because it basically describes the effect of this regularization term I call regularization error. Unfortunately, I decided to call, to denote this regularization error by an A, which sounds more like an approximation error, but I th also thought that using yet another R may be a bad idea either. So, the regularization error is this capital A, and then we also have to consider the approximation error, which is the quantity uh, here, the second one. And the statistical error, we already know. Okay. Okay, so in the next two slides or so, I will show you a few results on how to understand these two extra errors. And as soon as we have understood these two extra errors, we are then ready to uh, get our first results in view of learning rates and consistency. Okay, so the first one, the first result I like to mention is the following. So it basically says that whenever we have a set, whenever we have a vector space E, which is dense in L1, so what is L1? L1 is the set of functions from x to r, for which we define the L1 norm to be the integral of f with respect to 2. 
dpx. Yeah? So what we basically just consider is if we have a function, we take the absolute value of that function and then compute the uh, area under the curve. This gives us a norm. And what we assume here is basically that whenever we have an element of this space here, we can arbitrarily approximate it by elements of E. This is denseness. And as soon as we have a space which is dense in L1 of Px, then this approximation error vanishes. And basically, this assumption of denseness here is in many, many cases also necessary. The um, second result states that if I consider the regularization error and let the regularization parameter go to zero, then the regularization error vanishes as well. Yeah? And in addition, if we have an element f star in E, which achieves the best risk in RLP, then we have this estimate. And maybe this estimate I can actually show here, because again, it's very easy. So, A of lambda is the infimum of all f of an E, lambda f E to the power alpha plus R L P F minus R L P E star. This was the definition of our regularization error. And now I just compare this infimum by the value for one very particular f in the space E, namely the element f star, so that I end up having this expression here. Yeah. So I just compared this infimum to the value at some other point, uh, namely f star. And now I use the fact that this should be an f star, sorry, um, that this risk is equal to the minimal risk. So this is zero. So I can get rid of that, and then we have exactly this estimate here. Yes, please. Yeah, so the question was, uh, how can we note, how, how can we know that there is such a function f star? The basic and simple answer is we can't. <laughs> we can't. It's just an it's just an illustration what happens if we are in the lucky situation that there is such a function. We don't know. If we knew that, well, then it would be, it would be easier, yeah, but we don't. Okay. Okay, so a few more remarks. Typically, in order to get such a linear behavior in lambda, we require such a minimizing function f star which is even worse, yeah? not even that we don't know whether such an f-star exists, but it seems to be also necessary. Um, also, a linear behavior is usually the best we can hope for, in the following sense that typically uh, we, can, we can at least often show that there is some beta between 0 and 1, such that we have such a polynomial behavior. And if lambda goes to zero, then beta smaller than one means that the right-hand side here is larger for small lambda than this. Yeah? So in that very particular case, we can choose beta equal to one, but uh, in general, we cannot. If we are lucky, we have such a beta, but even that we don't know. <laughs> 
Um, last but not least, and this is really just a, a side remark, is uh, we can actually find sufficient conditions for the existence of such a beta. And this is in terms of so-called interpolation spaces of the real method. So this is really going into uh, advanced things of uh, function analysis, so I don't want to talk about that here. For the moment, we may simply stick to the assumption that we have such a b beta, and uh, then if we have such a beta, we want to find rates. If there is no such beta, well, we don't get the rates I will present now. But uh, in general, we cannot really hope to find rates in all situations because of the no free lunch theorem. Okay. All right. So this was the Oracle inequality, assuming that we don't have an approximation error. So that approximation error vanishes, and we end up having just two error terms, the regularization error and the statistical error. So what happens if we let if we choose a regularization sequence lambda n, which goes to zero, but not too fast. Well, if lambda goes to zero, we just saw on the previous slide, then the regularization uh, error also converges to zero. So this one converges to zero. And this condition here just ensures that the second error also converges to zero. And therefore, the method is consistent. Okay, now let's assume that we have such a polynomial behavior of the regularization um, error. Then we can replace the function a of lambda by the upper bound and ask for the best lambda. And it turns out the best lambda behaves asymptotically like this. And the corresponding rate looks like this. Complicated? Don't look too close to the formulas. The only interesting thing here is that we don't know better, yet in order to obtain these rates, we need to know better, which is bad. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> okay, so mm, the next few slides will be about how we can achieve these rates without knowing better. Okay, yeah, maybe. This is basically the thing I just mentioned on the previous slide, so we can skip this one. Okay, and it turns out that something one would usually use in practice, maybe a little bit more sophisticated, but basically uh, the, the, the idea remains the same, actually works. So what will we do? So we have to make yet another technical assumption on the loss function I won't explain here in detail. And then what we then do is to split the data set D, for example, in, equal, in equally sized parts. This is not really necessary. We uh, can deviate from that up to a certain degree. Um, then we fix a finite, sets, a finite set of candidate values for our regularization parameter. Compute for all these candidates the corresponding predictor with the help of our first part, D1. And then compute the empirical risk of these predictors with the help of D2 and choose one regularization parameter that such that the corresponding um, predictor minimizes the empirical risk uh, with respect to D2. So what we basically do is we compute a couple of different regularized empirical risk minimization solutions and then test them on the second half and use the one with the best test error. Okay? So, well, one can phrase it a little differently. I've already mentioned that this approach performs empi regularized empirical risk minimization on D1. And this last step is nothing else than empirical risk minimization over this set of functions. 
and this set here was assumed to be finite, so we can actually use our very first oracle inequality. We have all the means to analyze this approach. And without going into too many details, the basic result says that if we choose the set of candidates in a suitable way, just depending on the exponent of our regularization parameter, then this approach of the previous slide is consistent and enjoys the same rates as regularized empirical risk minimization uh, enjoys without knowing better. Well, this is good. <coughs> okay. So, let's uh, make a summary of uh, what we've seen so far. So, first of all, the positive aspects. We derived finite sample estimates in forms of oracle inequalities, which is good because they're not just in they're not just of asymptotic nature. They really tell us something about giving a fi given a finite n. Huh? This is good. We use them to derive consistency in learning rates. The basic two questions uh, we like to answer for. Um, uh, we like to answer in statistical learning theory. Then we saw that a simple splitting approach of the data set uh, achieves a certain adaptivity, namely it can recover the best learning rates our analysis uh, for regularized empirical risk minimization could provide. Yeah? This was just the result of the previous um, slide. Also, the analysis is extremely robust in to changes in the scenario, meaning that if we want to go from IID observations to some other observations, if we want to have heavy tail distributions, anything like that, um, the analysis can often be relatively easily adapted. So it's a very robust type of analysis. And last but not least, this entire framework applies very easily to a lot of standard algorithms. And here I just mentioned one, namely support vector machines using Gaussian kernels. Yeah, something you may have uh, actually used in a course or so. So all that kind of analysis can be readily applied to these algorithms. Okay, so it sounds like that we have done our work, but as a matter of fact, we are anything that close to it. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the analysis we've done so far is really bad. <laughs> and uh, in the last 20 minutes, I'd like to give you some ideas why the analysis is so bad. And if time permits, I may give you an idea how one can do better. Yes? Yes. Well, if you replace Höfting's inequality by a suitable different because concentration the bound here. You could, yeah, this is, this is something which I haven't mentioned. If uh, in the IID case, so the, the question was, uh, in the IID case, uh, instead of using covering numbers, one could also work, for example, with other concentration inequalities, like McDermott's inequality. And indeed, this is the case, and some of the arguments become a little easier. But McDermott's inequality is really sensitive to the IID assumption, or some, uh, some modifications of that. If you but we always do this assumption, right? Sorry? In the end of the day, everyone makes the assumption of IID. Well, mostly because of laziness, not because, <laughs> <laughs> not because uh, it is the uh, most realistic assumption in practice. I mean, in some applications it is, in some others it's not. It heavily depends. Yeah? But uh, one of the reasons why one often sticks to the ID assumption is that the tools from probability are so, so much better developed than for non-IID observations. But as soon as you have some other type of concentration inequalities, almost everything from the analysis I've presented so far can be copied and paste. 
Okay. But uh, what we yes. Um, so so when you derive the the bile, so you take the supremum over the this class of function. Yes. Right? So so essentially you get the worst performing in that class of function. So but you can imagine that maybe in in practice you may have an another solution in that class that so might perform better. So the question is, can we improve this bar? So that actually that actually goes to the very heart of why the rates so far are very bad and why one can actually do way better. Uh, the fact that we uh, considered relatively large sets of functions where we uh, had, had to do this union bound about it uh, is actually at least for two reasons the source of our bad estimates. There are some other reasons as well. But uh, yeah, this is it. Really lies at the very heart of uh, of the uh, badness of our techniques so far. And maybe you will see that just on the next slide. So this is the basic argument of why, for regularized empirical risk minimizers, this rate we have just obtained is never optimal. <laughs> um, so remember one of the previous slides, we established this kind of convergence under the assumption that our regularization parameter, uh, or regularization error behaves like lambda to the power beta. This was one of the rates we obtained here. So we basically showed this inequality here. Um, and then we have to remember how we proved it. We actually proved it by showing that the Solution, the empiric solution is in this kind of ball. Yeah? But this kind of assumption here led to this inequality. And what we now observe is that this excess risk is always greater than or equal to zero. So we can make the left hand side smaller by just ignoring the excess risk. which basically means, or this should be an alpha here, which basically means that instead of having this estimate at the very beginning, we now have, with high probability, this estimate. Yeah? We can get rid of this excess risk because it's non-negative, and then we just have copied this part into here and this part into here. So with high probability, instead of having this Worst case bound, we actually have this bound, which is better. Because here we have a right-hand side which is constant, and here we have a right-hand side which converges to zero. Okay? So, we could go into the proof and just consider the data sets for which this actually holds. And then repeat all the um, arguments we've done so far, just for the smaller ball. Well, the result would be that we get a better estimate here. And then, using this better estimate, we get a better estimate here, go back into the proof, repeat that, and so on. So we can constantly improve our estimate and our rate using this kind of iterative scheme. Of course, uh, there is a limit uh, convergence rate which we can't get better, but uh, as you see here is the initial rate we obtained here can always be improved. So if we really want to analyze the things, we need to have a technique which addresses this. There's another reason, kind of similar. But this one is uh, already directing in, into the, the idea of your question. We actually optimize with high probability, not over this ball, but over a smaller one. So there's another reason. So instead of considering um, 
instead of considering Höfting's inequality, we could also use Bernstein's inequality, which looks somewhat similar. So again, we have uh, IID, observation, uh, IID random variables, for example, um, bounded. For technical reasons, we now assume that they're also centered. This doesn't really matter. And we also assume that they have a finite second moment, and we can bound this finite second moment by sigma squared. Well, because they are bounded, they always have a finite second moment, but the idea here is that our bound on the second finite moment, on the second moment, is significantly smaller than the B. Yeah? And then the result basically says that um, the empirical average, which should converge to zero because of this assumption here, is with high probab with small probability larger than this value here. And the difference uh, compared to Höfting's inequality is the following. In Höfting's inequality, we had to replace the sigma squared by b squared, and this term wasn't there. Yeah? So in Höfting's inequality, we did not have this term here, and that square root of n term had a leading factor of b rather than sigma. Now, if sigma is small, this may be a difference. Yes? No, it's a... Nope. So, Bernstein's inequality is not really a generalization of Höfting's inequality. It both... Both inequalities in their proof actually use the same kind of uh, proof technique. But because the assumptions are slightly different, you get slightly different uh, results. Okay, so why does this other uh, concentration inequality may help? The reason for that is that for certain loss functions, in particular for the least square loss, we have a so-called variance bound. And the variance bound considers the excess risk of some function f, then takes it to some power for the least square loss, this theta is equal to 1, and then the right-hand side dominates the um, basically the variance of this uh, excess loss. Okay, so this is a uh, an observation that for certain loss functions and or for certain distributions, we have this kind of inequality. And then using Bernstein's inequality rather than Höfting's inequality leads to two terms in the statistical error term, namely a variance term, which is of the order of 1 over square root of n, and a supremum term, which is of the order of 1 over n. And now we just have to um, rethink what's happening here. So the variance term has as a leading factor this value here. Now if we are in a situation that we already have a small risk, this means that we have a small variance. This uh, side goes to zero. Therefore, this side goes to zero, and therefore the variance term converges faster than 1 over square root of n. And the basic idea is that, similar to the regularization error, we would repeat this argument. So we would initially start with, uh, let's say, uh, an oracle inequality using Höfting's inequality, then consider... Um, uh, we would use a Bernstein's inequality at the beginning. Then we would use our estimate on the S excess risk, which uh, the Oracle inequality gives, to put this into the variance term. This variance term makes the right-hand side fire, uh, converge to zero faster. Therefore, we get a better rate on this uh, term again. We would plug, we would replug this into the variance term, and so on, and. By the same iterative idea, we would get better rates, provided that this assumption holds. And it turns out that if theta is equal to 1, 
rates up to 1 over n are possible. And this entire idea of iteration is completely superfluous. It works different, th differently. The proof works differently. Um, and before I briefly explain how the basic idea of the proof is, uh, I'd like to give you... Ah, these are two other reasons um, why, why our analysis is so far bad, but uh, we can skip those. Um, before, i like to give you an, uh, an idea of how the new analysis works. Let us finally have a look at some results, at some recent results, which actually use these advanced techniques uh, in order to get adaptivity. So here's a is the following problem. We do least square regression. Um, the labels are bounded. We use an SVM with the least square loss and a Gaussian kernel. And the Gaussian kernel always has an extra parameter which controls the width of the kernel. Yeah? And uh, now the result states the following. If we pick lambda and sigma by a suitable training and validation approach, which is exactly the same as we've done previously, now the only difference is that we not only have to consider a candidate set for lambda, but also a candidate set for sigma. Yeah? This is what you would do in practice. Then whatever smoothness our target function has, we can achieve the rates up to some arbitrarily small epsilon. So up to this arbitrarily small epsilon, this method is really adaptive. It does not need to know the smoothness of uh, the target function. It just works. Yes, so the width of the kernel is uh, very important, um, but uh, it's not the only reason. So if you just consider a simple kernel, kernel rule, yeah, you would also vary the width, and it's known that you won't get these results. So it's actually a mixture between regularized empirical risk minimization and varying the width. If you just... Uh, uh, varied the lambda and stick with one very particular sigma, you wouldn't get these results either. You really need to vary both. Okay. Ooh, I think I uh, skip uh, the idea of uh, the more advanced analysis and uh, like to say thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> <coughs> I sorted myself out with a silly cable here. Do we have any questions? <laughs> I just wanted to ask a little bit. How, does it, uh, how is it adapting exactly? Is it, is it that the Gaussian, you you're keep changing the Gaussian kernel to fit the smoothness of your target as you're learning about it from the data? Is that, is that what's happening here? So what you need to do is you have to consider different values for lambda and different values for sigma. And the larger your data set is, the more candidates you have to consider in a very particular sense. And then just by the idea of this training validation approach. So the basic idea of the training validation approach is that you have an oracle inequality for the regularized empirical risk minimization part and an oracle inequality for the um, for the empirical risk minimization part, yeah, where you just pick the best parameters. And it turns out that the oracle inequality for the regularized empirical risk minimization part always dominates the one for the selecting the parameter part. So selecting the parameter doesn't hurt you at all because it, it is always dominated by the statistical error you get using... Uh, the regularized empirical risk minimization approach at the very beginning. And therefore, this is the basic idea why, why this uh, simple selection approach works. The on top of it empirical risk minimization approach doesn't, doesn't hurt you at all. And the reason, maybe 
maybe I can, uh, so there's one inequality which may actually uh, illustrate that to a certain extent. So, when we considered empirical risk minimization over an infinite set, we got this error term. Now, if we have an additional regularizer, we get a similar result here. For empirical risk minimization, we have the same result for p equal to zero, provided that we only consider finitely many functions. But this is exactly what we do in this training validation approach. So we have actually two error terms, one which comes from the, empiric from the RERM part, which looks like this, and one for the selecting the hyperparameters part, which looks like this for p equal to zero. And that one converges faster than the one for p greater than zero. Are there any questions in the observation lounge while I hand the microphone on here? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> but we, have, we have some more here. Uh, so the theorem on slide number 55, is it also valid for m equal to infinity? Uh, let's have a look at 55. So the last one. Ah. If, if so if you say yeah. that 2 uh, times m over 2 times m plus d is minus 1, does that also hold? So if m equals, m equals infinity. Yeah. Well, the first question is, what is this space then? I don't know. <laughs> what? So what, what turns out, so if, if you have a different notion of infinitely many times differentiable, let's say if uh, you assume that your target function is actually, for example, analytic, yeah, then you can actually get very similar rates here, basically replacing m by infinity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No more questions in here? Ah, there is one over there. Yes, um, if you're, you're searching uh, the best function uh, in a subset in which you can calculate a uh, likelihood, uh, can you do the same type of analysis with uh, minimization of the likelihood is instead of the empirical risk? I, my guess is that at least uh, certain things may carry over. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if you ask, if you if you remember this uh, proof of showing that under certain assumptions maximum likelihood is consistent, that proof is very, very similar to the consistency proof for regular empirical risk minimization. Yeah? Very, very similar. If you ask for the more advanced techniques, well, for uh, maximum likelihood, you usually don't have a regularization parameter. And uh, whether you have this kind of variance bound, I don't know. And this is uh, the source of my uh, uncertainty answering the question. I've got two slightly crazier questions. Um, <laughs> so the first one is, is we consider sort of a case where the function that, that we somehow want to, want to get close to is in, within some sort of a a subset of, of functions that are somehow well behaved. They have a little bit of smoothness and whatnot. But oftentimes, if you look at pictures and whatnot, it's the case that they're well behaved in most places, but they somehow have some jumps and whatnot in other places. Yes. And so the question would be, would it be possible to not pick lambda and uh, sigma globally, but pick them sort of locally so that the estimator always adapts to to these different jumps and would we be able to then beat this bound if we were to be able to do that? Short answer, yes. And the paper is in its final, final stage. <laughs> 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 All right, so if you can do that, that adaptively, uh, would it be also possible to, to even go one step further 
and say, okay, we've had some observations. We've got some areas where, where lambda and, and, uh, and sigma should be picked in, a, in an interesting way. We want to know even more about this area and then pick some, observe some more points, label some more points in those areas we find, find to be very interesting, and then beat the bound even more. I don't know. You don't know? No. Uh, it'd be very interesting yeah. to know. <laughs> <laughs>